Uh, welcome to Civica Data Science Seminar Series. We welcome you to the launch event. And first, a couple household uh, items. This event is recorded. So this is just a reminder that this event is recorded. Uh, there will be a hashtag for the event, Twitter hashtag posted in the chat. Please use a Q&A function to ask questions when we get to the panel, to the panel discussion. And with that, let me start off with a brief introduction um, about the event itself. Civica, if you don't know, is a, is a result of multi-institutional collaboration. It's a consortium of Bocconi University, Central European University, European Univers University Institute, uh, Hertz School, National University of Political Sciences and Public Administration, Science Po, Stockholm School of Economics, and London School of Economics. All in all, we have 50,000 students and 10,000 faculty across these eight universities. And it's, as you can see from the list, eight leading European universities of social sciences, uh, humanities, business management, and public policy. This data science seminar series is a result of joint interest in data-driven technology across departments, academic institutions um, in this Civica Consortium. And let me just introduce the participants. Herty Data Science Lab, uh, we focus, so I'm from Herty Data Science Lab and we focus on research, training, and also contribution to the common good through data-driven technology. And we aim to develop applications, methods that will improve decision-making um, that is in public policy. We are based in Berlin, at the heart of Berlin, and we prepare students for leadership positions in government, business, civil society, where they can leverage breakthroughs in data science and artificial intelligence to solve complex societal problems. Another partner in the, in the program is London School of Economics, Data Science Institute. Data Science Institute at LSE, uh, forms the institutional cornerstone of LSE involvement in data science, working outside academic departments, DSI, Data Science Institute. Um, the mission is to foster the study of data science and new forms of data. Um, and the focus is on the social, economic, and political aspects. DSI aims to host and facilitate and promote research in social and economic data science. Our partner in Central European University, Department of Network and Data Science, carries out research in network science with a special focus on foundations and applications of network science to practical data-driven problems. The department across, works across disciplines to bring network and data science tools to many fields of the social sciences and related areas. Bocconi Institute for Data Science and Analytics uh, was established in 2016, and the aim is to promote and facilitate data-driven research at Bocconi University in Milan. Uh, Bocconi Institute for Data Science and Analytics is focusing on the analysis of large-scale data sets and modeling underlying complex phenomena while building a community of high-profile scholars that bridge the gap across data science disciplines and support the training at Bocconi. Science is Poor Media Lab is an interdisciplinary research lab comprised of sociologists, engineers, and designers. And the focus is on research around thematic and methodological aspects to investigate the role of digital technology in society. So the Across the disciplines, the focus of the partners and the lab is to bring this social sciences, digital methods, and design experts to join forces and work together to develop research that draws on the diversity across disciplines. European University Institute Tech Cluster investigates the challenges of technological changes with the aim to assist policymakers. 
the cluster uh, adopts a global perspective and focuses on EU's ability to play a leading role while preserving its fundamental values. So these are the core partners of this data science seminar series. And we're all members of Civica, the broader Civica family, which is part of the European Universities um, Consortium. The plan is to continue with the seminar series going forward on a regular basis and bring the best experts in the field and introduce aspects of data science that is important for society, for social world and for analysis of, from the societal economic perspective. And with that, I would like to hand it over to Professor Ken Benoit, who is a director of Data Science Institute at London School of Economics. Thanks, Slava, for that introduction. Um, welcome, everyone. We've got an interesting event, I think, uh, ahead. We're going to do a roundtable. And the roundtable is called very topical, a uh, data science, which is topical, and in the time of COVID and what happens after. And we're going to be exploring with four distinguished panelists this theme um, in a roundtable format. We're going to um, invite very shortly, um, well, they're here, but James Hetherington from the Alan Turing Institute. He is also uh, Director of Data Science and Practice at the Alan Turing Institute, but also Chief Data Science Advisor to the Joint, Joint Biosecurity Center. Martin Baelish, who is the head of the innovation cell at the United Nations DT, DPPA. Carolyn King, who is the global head of government affairs um, at SAP. And finally, James Palmer, who is a principal at the data innovation hub of Ofcom, the um, communications body, independent regulatory body in the United Kingdom. So welcome everyone and welcome to my panelists. Um, just to explain to you, uh, you already know, but also the audience about how this is going to work. So we're going to pose, I'm going to pose some questions to the panelists and we have um, Q and A section for taking questions. And those questions should be, um, your questions that we will then uh, pose to the panelists can be delivered in the Q and A. Please don't use the chat for that. And um, you can even upload some, some questions. We're not going to ask those questions during the first part of the round table. We're going to um, keep those questions through the second half of the round table when we're going to then take the audience questions and put them to, to our panelists. And we're gonna reserve about half the time for the round table um, for audience questions. So we hope that you'll, um, you'll send us your, your best questions and um, you know, if they get answered in the meantime, then you know, we, might, uh, we might remove them from the list. Right, so um, panelists, you please um, take your videos off and uh, there we go. Uh, very good, and we're also in the, uh, the panel mode. I guess uh, individual people watching Zoom, you're probably all Zoom experts at this by now. So you can possibly change the view on your own or uh, as set your preferences as you like. And um, I think we're just going to go in the um, order that I had uh, listed um, at the beginning um, from the slide. And let me put the following question to each of our panelists. I'll give each of you a chance to answer. So in light of this theme about data science and digital transformation in the age of COVID and what happens after, um, tell us a little bit about your organization and the role that data science plays in it. What are you working on specifically? So if we could start with James, please. Hi, so uh, the Alan Turing Institute, which is my home organization, is the UK's National Institute for Data Science and AI. Uh, it's a consortium of 13 universities uh, working together to uh, look at how we take research from those universities and apply it to a variety of real world challenges in, in, in a number of different subject areas. Um, there's two areas that I'm particularly focused on at the moment. And of course, one of them is uh, in late April uh, last year, um, I ran towards the screaming 
um, rather than away from the screaming, which is the usual direction of running um, uh, with regard to, well, we believe that we ought to use data and data science to help make uh, well-informed decisions. Uh, and um, the UK decided to form this joint biosecurity center, which is an entity to um, help uh, advise government with, uh, on policy with respect to coronavirus challenge uh, using data and data science. And I've been spent most of my year in that, which has been an interesting story. Um, uh, the other area that I'm, I'm really interested in at the moment and working to, to pull a project together on is um, a project to leading up to the Glasgow Climate Change Conference uh, in November next year, uh, or November this year now, I should say, on um, demonstrating the value of digital twins uh, for climate resilience and decarbonisation. Um, so that's uh, and the other thing I'm working on. And then finally, just to say, the thing I'm sort of most interested in isn't the what can we do with the most advanced latest mathematics kind of uh, thing out, out of data science, but how do we get past the blockers for making data science real? So sometimes we talk about it as the AI plumbing um, uh, and it's those issues, um, how to move from a world of spreadsheets and PDFs to a world of findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable open data and fluently collaborating uh, with sharing models and data sets. That's the, the challenge that is most interesting to me. Great, thank you. There's a lot of interesting things to follow up on in there. Um, let's go with um, Martin, please tell us the, a little bit about um, the same question of how data science, what role it plays in your organization, what are you working on specifically? Well, thanks so much. And let me first of all congratulate Civica and, and all of you for this fascinating consortium and, and bringing us together today. I think this is a, coming at the right time. Uh, I work in the Department of Political and, and Peacebuilding Affairs. And as you might be aware, the United Nations adopted for the first time in its 75 years a data strategy last year that really tries to push the culture in the organization towards more data sharing, data stewardship, transparency. And that's a big opportunity. I think at a time where COVID has made the world much more data literate, more understanding of data and also more data hungry. Um, as mentioned, uh, in the context of peace and security, we cover data from different angles. Uh, that includes machine learning, geospatial analysis, big data mining, natural language processing to teach machines how to understand dialects around the world and conflict zones where we have low resource uh, problems to tackle. We look at machine vision that helps us to unpack, for instance, uh, insignia of um, non-state actors. Uh, we look at a speech to text analysis to have a, a better finger on the pulse on what is said on, on radio and television, which is still king in places of the world where Twitter and Facebook and other social media channels are, are less relevant. And we're also looking at predictive models a lot to really understand and unpack you know, what are patterns when it comes to armed conflict uh, um, around the world. Um, we truly really believe that this practitioner scholarly exchange is a, is a good opportunity. I think there's a lot to learn from different worlds, uh, not just the public sector, the private sector, but also academia really has a bridge between uh, the different players in that field. Yeah, and I, I, I really uh, look forward to the conversation today in that regard. Over from my end. Thank you very much, um, Martin. So um, James is declaring war on COVID, you're declaring war on war. That's some interesting perspectives there um, to, to follow up on. Let's, um, let's hear now from uh, Carol, Carol um, who can tell us a little bit about the role that data science plays in your organization and what you're working on. Thanks very much, Ken. If you're, if you're calling me Carol King, you're dating yourself. Um, if you remember Carol, but it still does happen to me once in a while, Caroline. And uh, thanks for having us, having me and having SAP uh, on this prestigious panel. I should throw in two caveats right at the beginning. I'm not a data scientist. I'm a political scientist of the old fashioned school. I've been working with SAP for 20 years. So I've had to learn a lot, a steep learning curve, uh, but you are more of uh, all much more experts uh, on the data science topic than probably I am. I spend my days trying to translate uh, what the technology can do and interpret for my audience, uh, government stakeholders, policymakers, and the like. 
And just to quote a conversation I had at 6.30 this morning on our uh, solution for vaccine distribution, which of course we are interested to sell, uh, as you can imagine, to countries around the planet. Um, the Indian uh, response was, if we can distribute the vaccine successfully to several hundred thousand using an Excel sheet, we can do it for the rest of our population that way too. And I think that really, uh, for me, in a nutshell, sums up this COVID phenomenon and how it reflects on our business. It has definitely been a motivation for digital transformation, but it's really exposed the gaps and the risks and where um, a lot of policymakers and a lot of countries are not in their digital agendas and how much we need to catch up. I'll stop there uh, by way of introduction. Thanks a lot. Uh, I can see that this theme of digital blockers and the effective delivery of data science is going to be definitely something that we talk about. Um, the spreadsheets for a billion, billion rows. Wow. James, why don't you tell us about the role that data science plays in your organization and what you're working on specifically? Yeah, great. Good afternoon, Ken. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone else. Um, yes, I work for Ofcom, the UK's communication regulator. Um, for those who aren't familiar, that covers um, our broadband, mobile telecoms, TV, radio, video on demand, uh, network security, um, and radio spectrum, uh, quite a, and post, sorry, so a, a huge portfolio across the communications sector. Uh, I joined Ofcom around just a bit before this time last year, so I had a few weeks in, under my belt in, in an office meeting people before um, moving to the virtual working environment, so it's been quite an interesting introduction to the organisation. Um, I joined the Data Innovation Hub, we've created a central function to promote and drive our use of data and um, innovation in that space across data science, data engineering, governance and ethics and everything else like that. So we've got a pool of analysts around the business in different functions doing a whole lot of great work, um, not just data scientists, obviously a whole range of other professions. So we're sort of centrally trying to glue that all together and enable people to do new things in, in different ways to make the best of what we've got. And my job's a, a bit of what everyone else has already described really. So that a lot of work on the infrastructure side of things, making sure we've got the right tools and capabilities to deliver analysis and do that efficiently. Um, experimentation, so trying new things, trying new methods, um, having a bit of bandwidth to do that and experiment because that can often be difficult to find the time for otherwise when you're when you're working at pace in organizations and also delivering or developing our professional sort of curriculum and, and career support and advice and in um, recruitment processes so we can attract them um, and retain and develop great talent in the organization as well okay Thank you very much, everyone, for these self-introductions and really interesting descriptions of what you're doing in your various roles. I can see we've got a good mixture, but also some, some clear overlaps in terms of topics. Let's go to this issue. Let's, let's return to this issue about, um, I'm not sure what to call it, blockers, um, data science blockers, because it's a recurring theme that we might have access to theoretical technologies for AI and data science, but seeing that these actually translate into policy, especially the sort of policy that could help us get through the challenges of the pandemic is, is a different thing entirely. Uh, I know that there's incredible medical technology and digital technology, engineering technology in India. And to hear that description, Caroline, about the spreadsheets is rather shocking. Um, tell us a little bit more about that. And we want James to tell us a little bit about some of the, the blockers that he was describing. Yeah, I can give another anecdotal example. It's not fair because it's not typically the, the it's not, it's also probably not on brand. Uh, I think my marketing colleagues would all, their, their toenails would be curling up if they heard me. But um, yesterday I did a session with um, about 60 SME customers in the aerospace and defense sector in Germany. And they had a survey in, in advance of that and only half of them had a digital strategy. They all saw the importance of it, but, um, they're you know, far, far behind where they should be, especially considering, think about, I mean, we, we are so proud in Germany in particular about the um, SMEs and there are a lot of market leaders in the SMEs, but uh, they're still market leaders in many cases for their manufacturing technology and not necessarily for the integration of digital technologies and data science in what they do. And of course, that's a sector that's really hard hit, right, under COVID, so they're all in a bit of a panic. Um, just to, to give another anecdote from that side. I think 
um, still, I shouldn't over uh, weigh that aspect of it. That certainly, COVID has done a lot to um, drive digital transformation, to show governments that, um, uh, that digital readiness is a, um, absolutely key and crucial. And I think a lot of governments went a long way already in, in, uh, in short-term solutions, at least. So we, for example, and even for SAP, that was a bit surprising, built the Corona Warn app um, with uh, Deutsche Telekom here for, for Germany. Um, I think that uh, surprised a lot of government actors and ourselves that we could build an app in a very short period of time. Um, it wasn't the only one we did in 48 hours. We also made a repatriation app for the German foreign ministry to bring back German nationals uh, who were stuck in various places during the first lockdown. So uh, I think, and there's been a lot we've worked, you know, that we um, acquired Qualtrics uh, a few years ago. And I think that probably that old sentiment analysis, the experience uh, data, the use of that kind of data is really, I think, what's going to be the lasting Im impact in, in it. It's had made a big impression uh, in our, at least in our ecosystem. Um, they, uh, Qualtrics reached out uh, and provided uh, quite a bit of um, solutions and tools free of charge in the immediate lock, uh, first lockdown. And that whole you know, sentiment analysis, workforce management, employee and customer satisfaction, all of that, uh, the value uh, in, that, you, that that can generate with rapid response and, and creating resilience in organizations, I think that's a big um, win for our entire ecosystem. And of course, those are solutions that are relatively easy and quick to adapt, right? It's another thing if a government has to uh, import our ERP, the whole uh, um, intelligent backbone of an organization that takes years. A lot of that software sits on the shelf. Um, it depends on how well the implementation goes, the relationship with partners and the willingness to change an entire culture in an organization. But um, this sort of fast uh, track solution at the front end, the little speed boats as we call them in the SAP <laughs> world um, that are circling around our mothership uh, and all of our classic old solutions, that's really made a difference and made a lot of inroads. And I think we will continue to, to see that evolving quickly. And that's, that's good news because those are um, uh, you know, changing mindsets in the public sector, but not so hard for them to adopt. Thank you very much. And I should correct, uh, Caroline is correcting me. She's the head of the International Affairs Program at SAP. So maybe, maybe the title slide has got that wrong. James, why don't you come in and tell us a little bit about more about the digital blockers that you were discussing and, and how they uh, affect your, your uh, how they're affecting the, the response to the pandemic. So I think one of the things that we've learned this year is that a good data infrastructure means you can respond rapidly. Um, and where we haven't had that, and we've been scrambling, and there've been longer periods of time where it should take it to get the data ready so we can we can start to do things. That's been, in what, for want of a better word, peacetime, you could take the manual data wrangling, right? You can take the, well, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, have a lot of smart postdocs, spend a lot of energy fighting with the data. Um, but if we want to be able to use these things against surprising challenges, and this is an area where, you know, I'm interested in climate resilience for the same reasons. It's, it's an example of where um, uh, doing something principled in this in, in this data readiness space changes the pace at which we can respond, and I think that's going to be going to be important. Um, the example I'm using a lot to 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 tell this story at the moment is one of the major scientific events of the last year was Google DeepMind solving protein folding. Um, you know, really transformative and exciting breakthrough. Um, made possible because of the protein data bank, right? The advances that DeepMind did are really exciting, but it was made possible because of the protein data bank. And that was, you know, bioinformaticians decided, you know, more than a decade ago, a couple of decades ago, to get their act together when it came to data readiness as an entire discipline and field. And that, and the rounds and rounds of competition over protein folding because the data because the data was was there um is what made the breakthrough this year possible um so when people tell you uh google solved protein folding i think the people that got together to, to sustain the protein data bank are the ones that solved that problem and that's the challenge that we need to be bringing to uh other research domains 
what's the PDB for social and economic data science? Okay, thanks very much. So you're, um, James, I think your background is as a mathematician, but uh, and Caroline has described hers as a political scientist. I was originally also trained as a political scientist. Um, Martin, let me ask you, you're involved in peace. Did I get that right, James? Yeah. So a long time ago, I was a theoretical physicist. Then I mainly did mathematical biology and health data science. And nowadays I do applications in as many different areas as I can think of. Digital humanities is one of my favorite areas to work in at the moment. So I'm doing on another project, 19th century history with data science methods. Um, so uh, my supervisor calls me a dilettante. But, um, OK, well, so if you're a political scientist like I am, then theoretical physics, your, your experience with theoretical physics is limited to Star Trek episodes. Um, so clearly, there are different there are different skill sets, people using data science for the meeting the challenges of the current age. Martin, tell us a little bit about your background and for your uh, you described your efforts in predicting uh, peacekeeping and uh, peace building and predicting armed conflict and using that uh, filter into peace building. Um, has that changed at all in the wake of the pandemic? And also address this issue about whether, um, which type of expertise is primarily useful in feeding into that data science and overcoming these blockages, we could call them. Well, thanks so much. I'm, I'm thinking here that, you know, professions become less and less relevant because we have seen uh, a crossover of disciplines and new disciplines emerging. There's no the traditional way of how we address international affairs anymore. We have computational social science, we even have master's programs in computational international relations, right? Where you take 50% computer science, 50% international relations, even international relations is a crossover of multiple disciplines as well as is uh, behavioral science, right? Which is not just uh, peace psychology, but really a merger of all of that. And I think that's hopefully the trend that will help us model through the mess that we are facing. And I wanted to add an additional component to the discussion uh, in the context of the pandemic, which is the digital comments. And I think the, the COVID-19 pandemic has showed us that, you know, the future needs to be about a shared common good of, of data. And uh, when it comes to the distribution of the vaccine, you have heard the UN being very loud about equality so that we cannot, you know, see uh, a greater uh, um, kind of inequality gap, just the way of how the vaccine is distributed. And I think uh, an additional point to that, and that's the flip side of all of this is, uh, you know, what many call the infodemic, including mis and disinformation, cyber attacks, including our hospitals and laboratory we have seen uh, over the past. And it has been the first time in the history uh, where technologies and social media has been used both to inform people and keep us connected as well as to drive us apart and undermine the global response and, and you know, uh, uh, jeopardize all the measures that are uh, attempted to be taken to contain this uh, disease. And I think that's fascinating. That data on one side is kind of a so solid companion to measure the fallout of the, of the health crisis. And at the same time, a reference point also to assess the impact uh, of straight fragility, state fragility in that context. And uh, dispelling rumors, fake news and messages really at the, you know, at the heart of the United Nations work, you might have heard uh, of the UN's uh, um, a project, which is called Verified, the Verified Initiative, where we have been encouraging people everywhere uh, to think twice before you tweet, to uh, be clear about you know, how you respond uh, to um, you know, the digital discourse in order to uh, keep an eye on the facts and, and on the data and, and you know, keep that in check with, with assumptions and, and uh, maybe uh, some confusion that exists. And I think in all of that, um, I think we and I have learned that science must come first, in particularly in those moments of great uncertainty. And I, and I hope that will stay with us uh, in, in the future to come. Thank you. Thanks, really. Thanks a lot for that answer. And um, absolutely, the point about social media being a double-edged sword is the perfect transition into uh, me asking James about this same question. Um, I know Ofcom is involved in a lot of matters about regulating things. Um, related to communications, but um, what challenges have arisen as a result of the pandemic and possibly the misinformation that Martin spoke about through the double-edged sword of social media? Um, thanks, Ken. Yeah, so well, ofcom has been named by government to be the future regulator for social media and, uh, and online platforms. We don't yet have those regulatory powers, so that's still being 
work through, but it's certainly be something we'll be spending a lot of time working on and thinking about in the future. Um, specifically for the, the for the, the pandemic, obviously the communications sector has been utterly fundamental to how people have got on and managed and uh, and, and, and lived their lives as a result of um, all the lockdowns and various elements like that. So the main challenge for us was, or, or the sort of opportunity and challenge, we had a lot of data that we hadn't really thought to use for the purposes of an, an insight that we could generate that was really beneficial to the pandemic. So it's really shone a light on the fact that as well as our systems not necessarily being as agile as we need them to be, but we do have a lot of data siloed around the business that when brought together or when looked at through a different lens which we had to in this particular circumstance can really provide some new and interesting insights so obviously we do a lot of work to understand how people use communication services how they interact with them how they what their experiences of that are as well so knowing immediately as everyone into lockdown how those behaviors changed and tracking those over time has been something we've been able to do but probably would never have thought to have done previously so it's been really useful and interesting and we've been able to publish a lot of that data um, to help inform uh, the, the ongoing dialogue and people understand the impacts of the uh, pandemic on, on people's lives in that regard. Sorry, you're on mute, Ken. I thought I would avoid that novice mistake, this roundtable. So uh, looking at vaccines, um, vaccine misinformation is a hot topic now as we try to roll out vaccines and ensure that people have uh, realistic information about their their safety is that something that you're you're into there at Ofcom or um, or providing the trying to put the infrastructure in place to to monitor um we not not especially now we but part of our um consumer monitoring is looking at people's um ex uh, exposure to those things and experience of it and where they're getting their news and information sources from so um we run a series of tracker surveys and we've been able to adopt those surveys to ask people about their experiences of these things so we're through our understanding of um, consumer experience that's where we're, we're looking at those things at the moment and we've been able to fold those into our publications and statistics as well as where people are getting their their news from where are you finding that people get their news from Oh, yeah, you put me on the spot. There's one of 50 of our publications. I, I probably haven't memorized all of them yet in the, in the few months I've been at the organization. But I think it was fairly reassuring that I think the vast majority of people were getting their, their news from the sort of uh, main UK news suppliers. But obviously, online usage has gone up considerably and more people are making more use of um, uh, messaging services and things like that. So that there has been a considerable shift, as understandably, to those um, mechanisms and sources, but I think still for trusted news, if I remember correctly, it was still mainstream um, media news organizations. But yeah, please check out our publications on the, on the online nation. James, did you? Yeah, please. One of the things that I think it's important to think about in this context is that the space through which coronavirus spreads is the social graph. That's the, 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 the space that it's propagating along. And we, you know, it's looking to me more and more like we have some quite distinctly behaved epidemics in different parts of, uh, of that social, you know, of that, of that social space um, with some sub communities with uh, significantly lower levels of compliance with non-pharmaceutical interventions. And it's going to be the case significantly lower levels of, of vaccine take up and, you know, our numbers significantly below one in one sub part of the, of the social network and above one we fear in other parts of the social network. Um, so the social graph and the way we infer the social graph and use that to inform modeling and ultimately policy is a big area of, of, uh, of, of, of importance I think here because it's not just geography through which this disease is spreading. It's a, it's a multi-dimensional space with the social and economic dimensions being really critical to, to, to the people's proximity within that graph. That's an interesting point. We, we've used the word virus, virus and viral transmission and something going viral as a metaphor originally adopted from the biological function um, for things like computer viruses, which are not actual viruses or videos that go viral, but um, we're now reminded what happens when an actual virus goes viral, uh, worldwide spread, and the vectors of transmission are, are substantially the same. It's just you need a physical proximity for the actual virus. Does anyone else want to come in on that point? I, I'll, I'll keep putting some points to you. 
Okay, well, let me let me uh, let me follow up on that. With um, every crisis, is also an opportunity, and sometimes people have said, "Never waste the opportunity of a good crisis." Um, what unexpected opportunities or benefits might be arising uh, for making progress on solving these, or even just the general process of data science advance or digital transformation that might have um, been provided by the pandemic. Carol, you talked about some challenges um, related to the effect of uh, tracking vaccines and, for example, and using some of your technologies. Um, why don't you take a first go at that? Yeah, those are also obviously for a company like SAP opportunities, clearly. Yeah, supply chain optimization is probably the number one. Uh, we had um, right from the very beginning, uh, we opened up the Ariba network so that hospitals could try to source where they might find beds and masks and the like. So that's um, that's been a theme uh, accompanying this entire process and, and uh, uh, will not uh, disappear. Mm. The, we've had a boost and a refocus within the company on the public sector. So that's probably the second big pillar. Um, I think SAP spent many years kind of picking the low hanging fruits in the large enterprise uh, 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 community and has now uh, discovered that government is um, not just a facilitator and a regulator, but also a very important customer uh, again. And there's a lot of money sloshing around in the system um, for solutions that, and uh, that's been definitely a, an opportunity that the company's uh, keen to take up. And then, um, as I say, at the, again, uh, with all of the X data, um, you know, that integration of the X and the O for us um, and what Qualtrics has been doing at the front end. Um, we talked about predictability, but also with regard to James' last comments about increasing trust, uh, the social end of the, of the disease and the implications and, and uh, reinstating trust in governments, there, there are a lot of technologies uh, that, that have um, been developed pretty quickly also within our ecosystem to try to, to uh, provide answers and, and responses for not just governments, but um, agencies and other organizations as well. So I think those are um, uh, really the three major pillars of the opp opportunities. Long-term, I would say what's interesting for us as well, it, um, to see the whole purpose-driven, uh, social, sustainable focus of companies, what companies are doing, that, that's really moved up um, uh, a company's agendas and, the SA and SAP's agenda as well and gotten a lot more visibility at the, at the board levels. And that's good news because there are a lot of initiatives and, and dedicated colleagues uh, driving kind of things in a segmented and, and uh, sort of not always um, uh, so well uh, awarded or recognized way in, uh, within companies uh, across the board. And now I think um, that everyone's seeing that the effect of that triple bottom line and I think the COVID has done, uh, yeah, a favor, done us a favor in the corporate sector and pushing that agenda up uh, onto the visibility and the radar of CEOs. Thanks for that. Who else would like to take a stab at that? Maybe Martin, has there been any opportunities created by the pandemic um, for data science and or even just advances in your general problem area? No, no, thanks for that. Um, I have a few thoughts on that. One is that the pandemic definitely has made the United Nations, uh, which is you know, in a bureaucracy in the end of the day as well, uh, particularly the Secretariat, more data savvy. Uh, you see the conference building behind me, that's the Enstrom's Hall in this kind of glass steel building on First Avenue in New York City. And a lot of the work in the past was you know, paper driven. And now we are in a paperless you know, operation, which I think is fascinating for information management. This has really brought us you know, 10 years of learning uh, within a time span of, of, of 12 months. And the second point that I think you know, is something for, for us maybe to take, us, take, to take with us in, in the future is that you know, this weight of remote conversations, which definitely has lowered the carbon footprint. And I, I wonder whether you know, somebody has already done the math on that. Com uh, computing energy and, and the environmental impact of all the Zoom calls uh, versus, you know, all the flights uh, for a one hour conversation at the LSE, you know, uh, and so forth. So I wonder, you know, what's going to be uh, the uh, the equation in that regard, but it has certainly 
increased inclusivity because now people from around the world can can watch us listen to the conversation and don't need to be in a room in London somewhere in Berlin right to follow those conversations that's I think a big opportunity I would like us to take further and that's something we're looking at and the third point I want to add is something that I mentioned before I think the pandemic has made the world more data literate data sciencey language um, like you know flattening the curve is now a standard vocabulary we don't have to explain people how to hold the chart or how to read it you know when it goes up uh, it might be good or bad depending on the context people also get that so that's not just what they looked at you know in the past on their balance sheet now they can put this in the context of global health issues and you know operational measures like you know um, you know, economic uh, uh, responses uh, to, to kind of get the pandemic under control. So I think that is good. And data has become certainly more acknowledged as an antidote to biases of, of human intuition. And I think, I hope that is something we take further so that we have this combination of, you know, behavior science approaches and data science approach that, that go hand in hand. So I think that's a big opportunity, not just for us as the United Nations, but for, for policymakers and, and society at large. If only there were a less costly way to teach people the meaning of logarithms and exponential curves. Um, Caroline, Caroline mentioned trust in government, and this is a big issue. There are both opportunities and challenges for trust in government through because of the pandemic. I mean, we've got issues about did the government create the pandemic is one of the people things that's in the rumor mill. Another one is uh, whether we trust the government to um, with the vaccines. You know, there are fringe parts of the internet where they think Bill Gates is using the vaccine to implant chips in people, sadly enough. Um, there are also um, trust about whether the government lockdowns are necessary or whether there's some ulterior motive. There are uh, issues about data protection and privacy when you install a tracking app. There are so many issues there that you could spend an entire roundtable talking about trust in government. Is there um, uh, any of you working on this issue of tracking trust in government or any any aspects of trust in government that have affected your operations? James. So related to that, but not quite that is, if you don't mind, Ken, is um, for us as a research community, the way in which we relate to government, um, which has been, and one of the particular challenges in terms of trust has been the balance between being able to give confidential advice to government and the desire of the research community to, uh, you know, continue in our open dialogue, open scholarly dialogue, publications, etc. Um, and that's been some, you know, interesting challenges negotiating through uh, all of that this year in places where. Um, the professional ethics of data science when applied to real policy challenges uh, gets a bit squeaky. And I think we, we've negotiated, uh, you know, we've navigated our way through it well, but the there's a trust in government issue as well as for the general public is what I'm trying to say. There is the way in which coronavirus has accelerated the need for uh, better relationships between scholarly communities and policymakers to bring all of this, 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 uh, you know, the, in, the intellectual power of society to bear on these challenges. Um, and I think that uh, that's going to be felt for a long time to come, you know, and, and reverberate for a while, a while as well. Um, and we're looking at, you know, the designing the next stage of the, the, the new National Institute of Health Protection, which will be the success to JBC and PHE. Some of those issues, I think, are, are, are going to be interesting in designing that. Joint Biosecurity Center and PHE is Public Health England for those of Sorry, you. yes, thank That's you. That's okay. Apologies. <laughs> James, certainly trust in government must be something you guys are deeply concerned about when you're tracking the flow of information and, and trying to recommend uh, issues about its regulation. Uh, it's, a sort of, it's a slightly different question. I don't think we track trust in government. We're, we're an independent regulator, but um, one of our responsibilities is to promote media literacy to, to make sure that people understand and are able to consume the information that they're getting from communication services and this has obviously been a a, a big shock to, to that system unfortunately that's not really a data science topic that i've been working on at any in any detail at this point in time but i know that's something we're really starting to think about um 
how people are consuming this new information which is and particularly the the cycle of information i think that that has been a huge um challenge both on the data side and all the other information that people are getting the the, the, the information cycle is, is so rapid that it's, it's it's out there and it's disseminated before you know what it is and before you can play catch up with it and it seems some fascinating topics by others on that on, on those particular topics how you how you chase misinformation and disinformation with the with the um, talking to a little bit i guess to what the work martin's been talking to there about validate the, the salience of those topics and how you, you keep pace of them but um yeah, no, no. In the, in the in a few months, I've been working on the data science side of things that hasn't that hasn't cropped up yet. But it's very interesting. So speaking not as a person, not as a in your role as your job with Ofcom, but in terms of your expertise in the area generally. So I let's say that I'm I'm deep against vaccines, and I decide to set up a website and I start publishing articles which are what we could charitably call misinformation, what we could just uncharitably call outright fabrications and lies. And then I start spreading this on social media. At what point does, do I cross the line from free speech to public damaging public health or doing something that would get me into regulatory trouble? Um, and what, what, what are the ways that, that uh, like how is that enforced? For me, wow, that's a huge question. At the moment, it isn't. I don't think so. That there are there are international discussions and debates on on all those topics, those very fine margins between um, freedom of speech and, and and thought and what people can and can't do online and social media and so forth. But at the moment, um, like I said before, the government is putting in place the legislation to provide to make Ofcom the regulator for social media platforms and for video um, on demand platforms as well. But that will be based on whatever government decides is, 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 is the framework for that and we will implement those regulations. Um, but again, that will be focused on the predominantly, I understand it, the, the platforms themselves. So what they, what role the platforms such as Facebook, Twitter and others should be taking to mitigate and manage against those sorts of things and to them to demonstrate that they're doing so rather than at an individual level. I don't know if there's any surprise or aspiration to, to police what individuals are doing on the internet. but. Um, yeah, ensuring that the platforms are doing their best to manage up both illegal content, but also non-illegal content, which is harmful, which is the sort of bracket under which uh, misinformation and disinformation could fall under. Okay, well, let's let's move on to another question. So we we talked about what opportunities might exist from the crisis. What let's talk about the future and innovations. So general question is what. What data-driven innovations can we expect in your field in, in solving your problem area in the next 10 years? Will these will data in the role of this change be uh, a paradigm shift or a game-changing revolution, or is it just going to be an incremental continuation of current current trends? Big question. But who would like to take a first stab at that? Caroline looks like she might might want to have a go. I'm sure you're thinking of the business opportunities ahead for of SAP. Of course, and the, 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 big, the big tag for, for SAP is intelligent enterprise, and of course, in the policy setting, intelligent government. So the company uh, firmly believes that's here to stay and that this uh, um, pandemic has given a, a push to the entire digitalization um, and digital transformation efforts in the among governments worldwide, we do see it and we do notice it. They have all have different, their roads are all at different lengths uh, that they have to take toward this end. But I would say that that is the goal and will be the goal. And that they, um, as as I say, as I said at the, at the beginning, even just our experience with the ex, um, experience solutions that the Qualtrics has um, uh had a huge take up on my many governments around the world in the first lockdown on, on you know, taking the pulse of uh, citizens and um, trying to come up with different measures, work, healthcare workers, um, vaccination trust, all of those topics have been picked up very quickly. And uh, I think that's um, whet the appetite of a lot of governments uh, for, for that transformation. Unfortunately, um, and now I put my political science hat back on, we're working 
you know, we have a global digital world. We, we thought that globalization was here to stay. We were, you know, been plugging this uh, free flow of data across borders, open markets. And at the same time, we're hitting a huge protectionist wall. And, and so many, most of my day job is, is occupied with the conversations with governments trying to explain to them why they're uh, shooting themselves in the knee by putting up these barriers to the develop to cross data to cross border data flows um, that decoupling is not helping uh, promote the digital economy um, that local data centers good fine good the protection of personal data understand it we try to comply as much as possible but um, when you take that to an extreme and talk about digital sovereignty and uh, want to therefore also uh, exclude international vendors uh, from from bids on uh, on digital transformation projects in country that's uh, 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 creating a, a, a huge obstacle um, for this digital transformation. So that's the push me pull you that we're dealing with. Um, and I really don't see that protectionist wave abating uh, in the next years. So I think we'll have to deal with those questions. Uh, and governments are, uh, and citizens of course are concerned about what's happening with their data. Um, and that, that is protected. We as a European company have the advantage that we work with a very good system with the GDPR. I think we've got the gold standard in Europe um, and we've, we're going to try to broaden that out into other fields and other sectors as well um, uh, beyond just uh, personal data protection. But it's a big, big obstacle in the road to get back to our original discussion that we're really going to have to overcome. Thanks. Would anyone else like to take a stab at that future development? James. So number one, both technologies and ways of working to enable us to collaborate around sensitive confidential uh, proprietary data sets um, is critical. Um, so all the, uh, the work on data trusts, et cetera, but also synthetic data enabling that. Um, getting this right so that secure data environments trusted data environments data safe havens trust, trusted research environments whichever of the different uh, um labels on that you want to use are, are productive uh rather than cumbersome um actually unlocks potential because at the moment we if you're not quite sure what it's safe to do if you're not quite sure what you're allowed to do you don't do it so good security enables playfulness and curiosity driven research but only if we get that right um, and i think that's one, going to be one of the big areas of transformation we're seeing particularly impressed by ben goldacre's work on open safely and um, if people want to look to, to to look that up um using synthetic data to enable uh you know really quite transformational um work with sensitive data um the other thread i think is the application of ai to data wrangling and the data pipeline so not what not how do we do uh, clever deep recurrent neural networks at the end of this, but how can we automate the process of moving forward from our legacy data inventories in companies and organizations of 85,000 PDFs and 90 million Excel files, right? And it's that automation that is the, the uh, of that moving out to the legacy that is necessary to move that forward. So those are my, those are sort of my two uh, tips for, 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 for important areas. Anyone else want to take a Martin? Yeah, I'm yeah. Happy, happy to come in there. Uh, um, you know, I'm thinking that data will not per se change our work in the next 10 years, but the availability of data, you know, and also the way of how we use it responsibly will, will change the way of how we live together and, you know, how, how we work. I think about the Internet of Things, which definitely will increase the further data stream, you know, where you can measure how much milk you have in your fridge, not whether you have milk in your fridge, but how much milk you have in your fridge, uh, or how many vaccines you have in a hospital and so forth, and then automated drone flights to resupply, uh, you know, coverage around the world. Uh, so that are imaginable scenarios. And then when it comes to how we use data responsibly, I'm, I'm always thinking about data for what? and data for whom as well. And those are questions we still have to answer, right? Uh, it's not just about having this kind of gold mine of, of data, but like we need to make sure that we are making responsible decisions with the data we have at hand. 
And when it comes to us in the Department of Political and Peace Building Affairs, we are thinking about new initiatives like, like Peace Tech, right? How can we really harvest the power of new tech and emerging technologies like natural language processing, uh, big data mining, you know, combined with issues like gamification, right? Drawing from theories of inoculation, right? To counter misinformation and, and, and complex machine learning uh, to make use of, you know, more live stream of data points and then not just be forward looking 10 years forward, but also backwards looking, you know, I, if I could be 10 years from now in this conversation, I would hope that we have technologies at hand that help us to retroactively collect data points to really look back to the pandemic in the early beginning, you know, and, and understand what went wrong and, and use new, um, you know, opportunities created by quantum computing, for instance, and, and other ways that we can't even think about. I think there will be new technologies 10 years from now that we can't even have a name for yet. Right, that will help us really to uh, you know make more responsible decisions, and and I would also hope that ten years from now we really have better access around the world to the internet and to communication at large, because there we see a gender divide. Uh, um, men have more access to the internet than women. That's you know a fact. Uh, I don't have the data at hand, but I'm happy to provide that in the chat in a bit. And we also see that there's definitely a gap around the world where. You know, global north, global south, whatever you like to call that. You know, there's definitely a disparity around the world of how we participate in that uh, kind of digital world. And I hope that 10 years from now, uh, we're much more connected in that regard as well. I can I can say something about um, my field actually um, with respect to training data scientists and how this has changed and the opportunity that that presents itself. Um, there was a there were sort of two strands of of people getting training in data science. There was sort of the elite university model, which is a bit rigid, but but you know the excellence where if you could, if you're one of those rare few people that could get into a top institution, you went through the formal track of study, you studied topics um, either including data science or focused on data science, and then you graduated with your degree and the expertise. Then there were the people, the the you know hundred times more people were starting to take courses on Coursera or Data Camp or uh, edX and all the online uh, opportunities that were either related to universities or separate from universities. And there were a lot of those people working in that space. There's been a convergence as a result of the shift to online teaching now where what we're doing and what we're developing in the university is a lot more like those other solutions, but also with a lot more outreach. I know at the LSE, we've been working a lot on what we call extended education to provide sort of auxiliary education that's not part of that first uh, limited space of core traditional teaching. So development of non-traditional teaching, and that includes the development of ongoing skills, which in the data science world, pretty much every, every data scientist needs every year, right? Because the, the tools, the technologies, everything is changing so rapidly. And I think this is, this is a, it's a challenging thing when you're a fat cat professor who would just like to dust off their notes every year, but it's an exciting thing in the field because it, it, it's innovation and, and it's new ways of delivering um, the knowledge to new, new people. Uh, and I, I could also add, we wouldn't be here today. Uh, I think a year ago, we still hadn't, I still, you know, the pandemic was still not upon us at, at this time a year ago. We were not doing Zoom seminars and data science or anything else at the university. You'd either travel there to attend or, or you know, go in person. They weren't live streamed uh, and now, people from any country um, can, can zoom in. And I, I attend data science seminars in, in, in the United States with regularity now that I would never have attended a year ago or before. James, you have a... I was gonna make exactly the same observation. I think that, that, that for me on the data science side of professional development has been immensely improved almost in the last 12 months. Like you say, like conferences would normally be a... Uh, you'd pick one of the ones you wanted to go to over the course of the year based on time and, and funding. And this last year, I think I probably attended over 12 conferences because I could, because they were all brilliantly delivered over uh, the digital channels, but also they're recorded. So yeah, now, now you, if you don't attend the conference, you can go and find it and you can look for the presentations and the speakers and information you want and dig into that. And that, that's been um, phenomenal, particularly as you start to do work in a new area, you don't have to spend all your time just sitting there and reading the academic papers and journals and stuff, you can actually go and see the people presenting on those topics. So it's been, yeah, that's been really useful and revolutionary this year. So, oh, Caroline, yes, the point. Hand yeah, up. I think we always, we forget so much because we're so freaked out about the, um, 
the impact of social media and we've all been traumatized by the Trump era, but it's nice to, it's nice that you remind us how important knowledge sharing, there's a nice the 80s uh, terminology for you, how much that speed that has taken up now in the last uh, year as well. That's exactly right. That it's not, um, it's so accessible. The accessibility of good content alongside all the horrible stuff uh, is, is really um, exponentially high, higher. And it's just a really important point we need to be making with all of our audiences all the time. James, did you have a point on that too? So just on the, um digital community building question um i'm more skeptical about the inclusivity of uh purely digital community building channels i observe that it's easy to maintain relationships through digital channels and it is to create new ones um and that we are somewhat uncomfortable about um uh, you know engaging in new communities still through uh through purely Zoom-based things. So I think once COVID permits, um, working out the new balance of which meetings we do in person and which meetings we do like this will be important. But I think there could be some diversity challenges if we only, just as there are obviously quite terrible diversity challenges if everything involves spending several thousand pounds to, you know, you can't build an academic career unless you can afford to spend several thousand pounds to fly to America to go on a conference. That's bad too, obviously. But we need, we do need to have some things to enable us to build the human communities. And I still think that's going to continue to need to inv involve a, a physical real world component as well as, as well as the digital. I have a prediction. I think that in 10 years time, maybe even five years time, it, at some point in the near future, medium term, we'll say, we're gonna look back at this era of these Zoom calls with these little panels and the two dimensional representations and it'll seem quaint and really antiquated. I'm sure that we're gonna have more immersive digital environments. And I think a lot of what we do will be, will be hybrid. There'll be both an online version for people to access who are remotely and also for people to access in person maybe using virtual realities the, the current experience of mixed mode physical virtual meetings where some people are in the same room and some people are on zoom is awful yeah <laughs> yeah i've seen the the little wheeled robots with the ipad on them where try to mimic a person it's absurd looking um we, so we've really so we, we really struggled with the, that sort of inception and discovery phase of projects as well. Like it's just the virtual environment for just sharing ideas, throwing ideas out, whiteboards and post-it notes doesn't translate at all well to digital. And I know it's a really rapidly evolving field for new software and technologies, but I think we've really struggled there to have that continued conversation now everyone's contributed at any point in time. It, it is staggered and stop start and you run out of time. So yeah, hopefully your vision does become true. Can be at the moment, it's, it, that's a real challenge as well, but just delivering data science projects. Yeah, I, I find personally that the, the the creativity component of formulating new new ideas or following up to refine, uh, to solve problems, really problem solving is so much better in person. There's, some, there's something much more productive and rapid about the process. Let's take some questions from our audience. So we've got a growing list in the Q&A and I'm going to pick out some here at the top of the list. I'll start with one of the shorter ones that's towards the top. So, um, and I, this is from anonymous attendees. So I'm not exactly sure where they're coming from, but um, I will say, uh, read out the question. So seeing how grossly underprepared most countries are facing this with this pandemic, what should governments do to prepare for the next pandemic and how can data science help us prepare for that crisis? Anyone want to take a first go? Big questions. So, so the most, I, I, I'll be careful with the details here. The most embarrassing thing that's happened to me this year is taking, I think, five months to get someone seconded from a research organization we really wanted to bring into the um, JBC challenge um, to the point where they were, uh, you know, bums on seats into the data environments and ready to work. Um, so something will need to be worked out about how we have rapid deployment of expertise to, to uh, of data science expertise and of interdisciplinary data science expertise, because we can't maintain sufficient reserves of expertise in all the different areas. So how, 
to to challenges, and that involves uh, IP agreements, data sharing agreements, uh, you know, and 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 agreements between institutions to be able to deploy that kind of expertise between academia and government and wider society at scale when when the time comes. And it may not be another, for want of a better word, plague, but the next century is going to contain a lot more of things like this um, that we need to get ready for. That's an excellent point. And you know, I know that you and I have had a conversation already about how the Data Science Institute can help help in that deployment and transfer of ideas. But this is a it's not just procurement of goods and vaccines, it's procurement of people as well. There's definitely a, an issue there. Anyone else want to take a take a go at that question? Well, let me let me ask pose another question then. So um, here it is. It seems COVID is a stress test for data privacy as countries with more stringent data protection have more difficulty in tracking patient cases. Same with personal freedom versus personal restriction for the greater good. Do you think that there are emergency cases that trump these fundamental rights? This is Trump with a small t. That trump these fundamental rights or are privacy and personal freedom always absolute? So look, I don't agree with the framing that uh, security is a blocker to productivity. Um, you, uh, but having clear rules and well-established platform technologies enables playfulness because you know what you're doing and you know what you're allowed to do. Um, so uh, you know, we set up a false dichotomy between these things if we're not careful. Strong, good rules coupled with good technology should make us more agile and more playful. Um, that's what I think. I don't have the full facts of this anecdote, but there was there was one of the um, states in Germany that was sending out COVID vaccine notifications to people based on predicting their age from their names because there it turned out was a misinterpretation of data protection rules weren't allowed to use the information about their birth dates even though that turned out it, it wasn't the case. Uh, but it was an overly aggressive interpretation or overly protective interpretation of data protection rules. And it's it's much it's much more common that the problems are due to if you're not quite sure what you're allowed to do, you err on the side of not doing things. Hmm. Um, Anyone else have experience with that? Or wanna? Well, it's certainly an interesting. I mean, look at if we look at Israel as a counterexample uh, uh, and how well they've been able to, and we're relying on that feedback uh, on on their the impact of their vaccinations, and they have a you know they they have a robust system for uh, protecting personal data, but they have a decision that they centralize that data that data infrastructure and those platforms. And um, then we look at what happens here uh, in Germany in a federal system. Where we're still using fax machines to send back reports uh, to get to update, you know, upload information in the corn worn app for the track and trace. So th there has to be, um, uh, yeah, it, there's got to be some flexibility in that model. And it is a, simply a question of uh, robust rules and good system and structure. And I think in Europe, um, as I say, with GDPR as a basis, we have a good foundation for that. We had a case where our GP, um, a GP's office would only take a faxed request for a prescription refill here in the UK. And I was trying to explain to my son, uh, I think he, you know, he was probably 20 at the time. He didn't know what a fax machine was. You know, he thought he might have heard of it. He had no idea what they were talking about or where you'd find one. <laughs> Anyone else want to uh, deal with that issue of privacy, data protection? Again, it wasn't thing I was particularly close to either in, in, in this context, but the, the GDPR protections and others have enabled people to have conversations that they wouldn't have otherwise had, I think, at this point in time around privacy. So there's assumptions around what we, if we just collect everything, we can use it. And then there was a healthy debate about, well, why do you need to be collecting half of that thing? And how, why do you need to store it for three years if you're just telling someone two days after they've been in contact with someone that they've, they've been in contact with someone? So there was some really interesting debate and discussions around that. 
Um, and from our side, I think the information commissioner's office made themselves immediately available pretty much to people who had questions and challenges and, and didn't, that the, I think that the, story, that the problem is people misinterpreting or misunderstanding the guidance and what you can and can't do within that framework. But yeah, from my perspective, the fact that the, yeah, the regulator in that space immediately recognized that was going to be a big challenge, made themselves available for people to take those questions to immediately and get a good advice and support was, um, was, trend, was fantastic. So I don't think the things constrain people if, if they are able to work with them and interpret them and understand them sufficiently, which I think is half the battle, if not more, as James was describing. Here's a question from Etis Vecafili. I probably have mispronounced that, but um, what do you think will be the worst outcome data science will bring to society in 10 years time? There's always something that has a negative effect. Martin's thinking about this one. I know he wants to try and answer. Uh, I was still thinking about the privacy issue, um, but let me, yeah, I don't have an answer to that it's straight away. Um, I think it goes back to the fact that data is always a, a double-edged sword. It can be an encouraging, you know, a, a vehicle for for making better decisions, but it can also scare us off from from making uh, decisions. So, you know, and I think that that question I would I would link back to good or bad data, right? And also the quality of how we collect data and how we present it, at what time, in which way. I think that's something we need to kind of address more clearly. Um, so that, you know, I go back to the issue of responsibility so that uh, the negative effects can be, you know, addressed uh, um, uh, before. Uh, and and uh, let me draw this back also to the issue of, of data privacy. And, and I was just thinking how to answer this because there's obviously a legal answer to that as a fundamental right, data privacy needs to be protected. And then there are many, many nu nuances and, and gray shades to that, right? And that brings us to the whole issue of ethics also, right? Like, like basically a whole scope of a conversation about, you know, um, like is half of the data we have available good enough to present to the public to make decisions, right? Or should we rather than hold back so that we don't create fear and you know inject you know uh, a greater turbulence? And I don't have answers to that. I think we just have to ask those questions now in hindsight because we have experienced ourselves with travel bans, with shutdowns, and I live in New York City where you know for the first time in the supposedly you know, Western and developed world, I've seen a march, if not even kind of you know, takeover of supermarkets just before the lockdown happened, right? Where people were fighting for, for like pasta and pasta sauce. And that was because of data that was released at the time in a, you know, in a way where now maybe in hindsight now we would say, maybe you could have done this in a more responsible way, right? So I'm just, I'm just posing questions back here to kind of negative scenarios of, of what role data scientists can play. What we what we are seeing now is, and you know, different member states are looking at this, is that we are seeing a, a definitely more responsible way of how you know science is brought into uh, decision making uh, uh, you know uh, rooms, and that that is I think important. And, and equally, you know, the same debate about um, ethics need to be brought into the conversation as well, because that's not just a mechanical issue that can be solved, but it needs a greater dialogue. And, and we haven't found those answers. I haven't yet, but. Caroline, James, and, and James might, might have those answers uh, at the fingertips. James. So, yeah, for me, there's an insidious harm that data science is already doing, which is making us believe that if we can't answer a question with data science, we can't answer it, and trying to become the only epistemology in town, um, which is not, uh, you know, which is not good. One of the wonderful things about statistics is statistics tells you rigorously when it can't answer the question. And yet, if somebody's paying you to try to answer a question with data, and your professional duty is to say, I'm sorry, mate, I can't answer that question with data, you're going to have to use other ways of thinking to get to, to, get to a, a policy decision. It's pretty hard to stick to your guns and do that, right? Because somebody's paying you to answer the question with data. So you re we really have to uh, make sure that we only use maths to answer questions when maths can tell us the answer and use the whole rest of our armory of ways of thinking about complex problems when, uh, as well. And it's, 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 going to, it's getting dangerous because it's getting to the point where if I can't, you know, people think that the only thing to do is to answer questions with data and that's, that's got to be wrong. 
Well, if, and I love answering questions with data. I mean, I'm a data scientist, but I liked it. One of my favorite things about data science is it tells you when it's failed. That's true. A scientist might tell you when it's failed, but unfortunately, if last year's taught us anything, the ability for to for anyone to listen is very different from from the statistical principles. Let me ask another question. Did, did, oh, yeah, we, didn't we just get through four years of showing what <laughs> the misuse of data science can do to our system? Or just I would, not that I want to retweet conspiracy theories, but yeah, I think there's a whole armada of Hollywood films out there that also show what the misuse uh, of these uh, of the manipulation of data science could, what terrible paths it could lead us down. But let's not go there. So I, I could put to the person who answered that question, watched season three of Westworld, which I just finished last week. There's this computer that predicts everything and then it decides to reduce the outliers by marginalizing them and, and, um, and, and at the end they destroy it. And then so no longer human behavior is no longer predictable. And, they un uh, and then the world basically destroys itself. So <laughs> it's like getting hooked on a drug to solve your problems and then your drug is removed and then suddenly you're in withdrawal and destructive. Here's a question from Ronnie Patz at the Hertie School. In your respective organizations, how do you build and cultivate bridges between data analysis expertise or data science expertise and issue expertise, for example, in public health, um, public policy? How do you make sure that the data people who work on substantively relevant, how do you make sure that data people work on substantively relevant questions and that the issue people make good use of data science? I'm happy to take that and just want to say again, thanks for uh, allowing me not to watch Westworld anymore because you just told me the plot um, it was on my list. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, next. Um, so we're looking to that. Or maybe another turn in a year from now, um, you know, just uh, wanted to add that. Um, taking any comments on other series I can watch. Um, anyway, on that point, which I feel very committed about uh, in the innovation set, we're trying to live that spirit. The UN went in the data strategy for, would love to hear the other uh, panelists, you know, thoughts on that. We went for a two-folded approach, which is one kind of way to strengthen expertise with data engineers and data scientists. And, you know, in the Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, I can't even hire at the moment a data scientist. There's no job profile approved by the General Assembly for the regular budget of the United Nations to hire somebody who has a data scientist background to join my team. So I have to hire somebody as a political scientist or under political affairs, who says political affairs, international relations, and other related fields to get that expertise in. That's going to change. So now we have a strategy and plan and in place, and we are literally changing job profiles. You will see more jobs coming out from the United Nations that require you to be data savvy. That's going to be tested. So that people at least are able to do a chart, GDP, country, and year. Three parameters should be easy to do, but it's not so easy for you know many, unfortunately, still. So that's going to be tested, and that's going to be kind of additional capacity uh, replenished to the system. Uh, the second point that we are making is that it's not about data ownership, but data stewardship. That nobody really owns the data, and this crossover of disciplines is important in that regard. So that it's nothing you can just give to the data scientist to solve with you, but you know, uh, something that you have to inherently understand as well, because eventually this is all about asking the right questions. I always feel, and I'm not a trained data scientist, you know, I probably got trained with somehow, but I'm not like, you know, I don't have a PhD in data science, I have a PhD in international law and, and system theory. But, uh, um, you know, what I learned is that you have to ask good questions. So I think building those bridges and joint teams and having a shift of culture to a data stewardship and, you know, making it a job requirement um, is important to, to allow this, this bridge community. And last point on this, I think, brings us back to Civica, and I'm really happy that you are, you know, build that consortium. Like, now those kind of consortiums, I think, are for us in the United Nations, a great opportunity to bring use cases to the attention of scholars, right? To say, hey, we want to solve the issue of water conflicts in the Middle East. We have data parameters based on geospatial analysis for the last 10 years. Can you give us an equation that works that helps us to predict the next six months on that? We can't solve that, but I guess you can. So building those conversations, you know, on an ongoing basis where international organizations, regional organizations, decision makers can bring wicked problems to data scientists and data scientists that are also ready and able and hungry to address those, right, in a conversation that is understood, you know, in the lingua franca of, of data, so not just scholarly and academic for the next paper, but also to really solve real world problems, that would be a wonderful, I think, in modus I, I could imagine.
Yeah, so uh, fingers crossed. And uh, again, send me any uh, ideas for other CS Westworld. It's not going to be on the list for a long time. Over. It's worth watching it just for the photography. It's absolutely brilliant. Any anyone else want to take a stab at that question? I'm happy to throw in. I'm, I also haven't watched Westworld yet, so thank you. Uh, enjoy my time. Um, I think for my side, we don't treat problems as data problems to start with. I think if, if, if there's a business problem or a research question and it, it remains of that, so we don't expect people to come to you with a data form, a formed data question, a formed data solution. Try and encourage everyone to get together at the, the offset of any new piece of work or ideation and just work that through. I, I, irrespective of your of your professions and see what becomes of it. I think as soon as you start to worry about whether or not the right methods or data are available, there becomes a blocker. And, and some colleagues feel put off by that, that if they don't know that what methods that you want to, you might bring to bear on that problem, and they, they might be reserved about bringing even problems to your, to, to your door to start with. So we encourage people just to bring ideas to us and we'll work out if there's a data solution beneath that, or if there isn't, then there isn't. Um, and similarly, from, and on the other side, from our perspective within, within, within Ofcom, we do a lot of communication and promotion of things that we've done. Just say, here's, here's, a, here's an example of a project we've done. Bear that in mind, because there might be synergies with what you what you want to do in the future. So if we're doing um, anomaly detection or something, we can break that down pretty quickly and just say to people, if you're looking for things in a data set or a space where they might not expect to see them, we can help you do that. Don't worry about how, just come and see if you've got a problem that looks like that, come and have a chat to us and we'll, we'll, we'll go from there and, and build out. Um, I think we've found that if, if you, Sometimes you just have to have a go at problems, even if you know they're not going to work as well, because that helps you demonstrate the benefit of improving whatever's not there. So data isn't quite often a blocker. But if you sit waiting for the data to be collected, it never will be. So you need to do something to stimulate the idea, encourage people to collect that data or, or do something differently in order to enable you to do another project in the future. Otherwise, you end up in that vicious cycle. of We can't do it because there's no data. We can't do it because there's no data. So you need to, um, to help sort of break out of that cycle even if it's just through synthetic data or experimentation, just to help people see the art of the possible. Okay, well, um, does anyone else have any, anything else that they'd like to add before we bring this really fascinating discussion to a close? Well, let me thank you all for this uh, wonderful discussion um, about some of the challenges of data science and how we can get past this crisis and the opportunities and issues that remain. Um, I hear a lot of themes that I hear. So a lot of themes echoed here. I've, um, I've heard elsewhere, which are about the personnel and about the bridge between substantive expertise and data science expertise and the bridge between data science analysis and decision-making that can get us through a crisis or to, to, to basically make that, that knowledge actionable. Um, and as an educator, these are themes that really come back and, and resonate with me because I know, you know training students, um, we're just now turning in, in universities and higher education to really focusing on this space we might call social data science to produce a sort of people that hopefully will there will be a job description for them, Martin, in the future that recognizes not just data scientists, but maybe this space of people with a social background, um, learning the data science and putting those things together, because that's really, um, you know, they say data science is a mixture of computing, statistics, and domain expertise. And it's very often that don domain expertise that lags behind when we think of data scientists. So I know at the London School of Economics, at the Hertie School, and at all of our member organizations at Civica, we're, we're trying to unite those three areas, uh, but especially from a classical position from our institutions. Classically, we were really good on the domain expertise, 